you're welcome. You're watching to the point. Is P. V. Narasimha one of the great prime ministers who hasn't got the credit he deserves? A book that's published on Tuesday argues that point very forcefully. It's called 1991: How P. V. Narasimha Rao Made History, and here it is. Its author is the former editor of the Business Standard and the Financial Express, and Dr. Manmohan Singh's former media advisor. I'm talking, of course, about Sanjay Baru, and today Sanjay Baru is my exclusive guest. Sanjay Baru, your book. 1991, how P.V. Narasimha Rao made history, is an attempt to credit him not just for transforming the economy, but for transforming the entire spectrum of Indian politics. You write, and I quote, P.V.'s leadership on the economic, foreign policy, and domestic political fronts has not received the recognition it deserves. In fact, you say later on, he deserved the Bharat Ratna. Now, everyone is familiar with Mr. Narasimha Rao's economic reforms. What are the key foreign policy reforms and the key domestic political reforms you attribute to him? Well, on the poli foreign policy front, more than the reform, it was the fact that India was faced with the end of the Cold War, the implosion of its most important strategic ally, Soviet Union, and a complete, uh, you know, desertion of India by many developed economies that we went knocking on their door for money. I mentioned the fact that you know Yashwant Sinha went to Tokyo looking for aid. Nobody was interested in India. Uh, so you, he was dealing with a world in which there was India's friends were disappearing, and the countries that mattered didn't care for India. He changed that equation between India and the rest of the world. That's first. Second, he established links with several countries for the first time, like South Korea, which today is one of the major investors in India and launched the Look East policy, reconnecting with Asia to our east. And of course, he recognized Israel and launched a new West Asia policy. So a, a lot of initiatives that have stood the test of time. What about on the domestic political front? What were the key reforms there? Well, the most important thing on the domestic political front was the fact that he revived the Congress party and kept it alive for five full years, kept it in office for five full years. Don't forget, that in 1989, when Rajiv Gandhi lost the election, uh, he had 197 members in parliament. And in 1991, before he was killed, all forecasts showed that he was not even going to get 197 seats in parliament. The Congress was on a uh, decline, and the BJP was on the upswing. Rao reversed that. Ra Rao, well, the reversal happened because of Rajiv Gandhi's death, but Rao sustained it and kept the party in power for full five years. Now, to try and understand why you come to the conclusion that all these achievements haven't got the credit they deserve, let's go back to the sort of country Rao inherited when he became Prime Minister in 1991. Not only was the economy collapsing, but Indian politics, as you say, had become dysfunctional, and global confidence in India was at an all-time low. In fact, you write in your book, India's ability to manage this crisis was in doubt. So there were two problems. A, a serious crisis of multiple types, and then the ability to manage it seriously in doubt. Absolutely. You know, Karan, I always say that the way to judge a prime minister is to see the, what the country was when the person becomes the prime minister and what is the nature of the legacy that he leaves behind. By that token, Narasimha Rao, in my judgment, was a great prime minister because he inherited a complete mess. He inherited a political mess in terms of the Mandal Masjid agitations. He inherited a political mess in his own party with the death of Rajiv Gandhi. He inherited an economic mess. He inherited a complete change in the global uh, power structure. And by the time he left office, he had stabilized the economy. He had stabilized his party. He had established relations with several countries. So that transition that he f uh, facilitated, I think that was his real achievement. And your point is that these achievements on all the fronts you just mentioned in five short years were a Herculean achievement. No ordinary prime minister would have been capable of it. And here was a prime minister who came in when no one expected him, and he pulled this off surprisingly effectively. Indeed. In fact, as you just mentioned earlier, in 1991, India's biggest problem was a complete lack of confidence in India. And by doing all of this, he restored confidence in India. You just look at the way the world viewed India in 91 and the way the world viewed India in 96. Com two different worlds. And this is why you believe a Bharat Ratna was his just dessert. Absolutely. I mean, you look at the list of people whom have given Bharat Ratna to. Uh, certainly, Narasimha Rao was figured in that list. Now, 
instead of the recognition he deserves, instead of the Bharat Ratna he should have got, this is what you write. The reality is Congress disowned PD. His name was virtually erased from the party's public memory. When he died, the party shut the gates of its headquarters and refused to bid official farewell to a former president. How do you explain this, not just contradictory, but bizarre behavior by the Congress party? Well, I think by the time he died, which was in 2004, uh, the party had constructed a narrative that required it to deal with him in this ignominious way because they had held him responsible for the Babri Masjid uh, destruction. They had held him responsible for the fact that the Muslim vote had drifted away from the Congress to the regional parties with Mulayam Singh in UP or Lalu in Bihar or you know, uh, Chandrabab Naidu in Andhra, etc. And they again pinned the blame on him? They pinned the blame on him. And therefore, they could not have hailed his uh, tenure because he was held responsible for all the party problems the party was facing. But your book actually has a very interesting explanation, which I believe in a critical sense is part of the thesis of your book. You suggest that Congress under Sonia Gandhi disowned Narasim Rao, literally shut its doors and gates on him, because he proved to be a better prime minister than Rajiv Gandhi would have been had Rajiv Gandhi lived to form a government in 1991. You write, and I'm quoting, he proved to be a better head of government than Rajiv, in terms of his ability to provide leadership at a particularly difficult period. What makes you say that? Well, first of all, I, it's not just if Rajiv had lived and formed a government. I actually argue that he offered a better government than what Rajiv was able to do between 1984 and 89, when he had f more than 400 members of the Congress party in parliament. You know, he had this two-thirds majority in parliament. And yet, if you look at the economy in 84, and the economy in 89, at the polity in 84, and the polity in 89, I mean, you know, you can see that Rajiv Gandhi's term was not a particularly impressive term. He wasted his mandate, which is why he lost in 89, and which is why he was about to lose in 91 as well. Narsimara, on the other hand, in my judgment, proved within a very short time, not by 96, in fact, by 92, proved that he was in a position to get control over an extremely difficult situation and assert his leadership. So I think within the Congress party, a lot of people recognized him as a, a, a good leader. But you really do mean that Narasimha Rao handled the post-91 situation far more effectively, far more judiciously than Rajiv would have been able to do it had Rajiv lived to be Prime Minister? Absolutely. And I say that on the basis of Rajiv's record. I mean, I, I don't just say it uh, out of the blue. I'm saying it on the basis of Rajiv's record in 84 to 89, and in fact his record as an opposition leader from 89 to 91, that he could not have succeeded in the way in which Narasimha did. Now, in fact, in Chapter 8 of your book, you go one critical and telling step further. You say that you don't believe Rajiv would have had the political courage to implement the sweeping reforms that Narasimha Rao implemented, and for which today Narasimha Rao is justifiably highly regarded. How do you know that? Well, you see, the point, I, I make this point in the context of the claims that several congressmen have made, that Raji was the original architect of the reform process, that he was the original liberalizer, that he had all these ideas, and if he had won in 91, he would have done all of that. And essentially what Narsimha Rao did was to implement Raji's ideas. You know, Jairam Ramesh has written a book more or less claiming this. And, but, but several other congressmen have come to believe this. And I argue that if Raji wanted to do what he claimed he would do. He would have done it with the 400 members in parliament. There was no opposition to Rajiv Gandhi between 84 and 89, certainly not till 87. At least VP Singh then leaves in 88, etc. But the first two years, 84, 85, 86, Rajiv had no opposition. And look at the range of his so-called reforms, very limited. You know, what Narasimha Rao did in 91 was dramatic. Let me play devil's advocate to that view. Many people believe that why Narasimha Rao actually was able to undertake the sweeping reforms is because there was a political and more importantly an economic crisis at that time. That crisis, particularly the economic dimension, didn't exist from 84 to 89. Admittedly, the policies Rajiv followed led to the crisis, but it hadn't matured and developed at 89 when Rajiv actually handed over to the next prime minister. Can you not therefore say that if the crisis gave Narasimha Rao the confidence to act, the same crisis would have given Rajiv the same confidence? Yeah, well, there are two points here. One, 
Raji was staring, I mean the country was staring a crisis in its face by the beginning of 91. President Venkat Raman tells Rajiv Gandhi, don't pull Chandrasekhar government down because he needs to present this budget to get a loan from the IMF to be able to handle this crisis. Don't do anything precipitate. And yet Rajiv does exactly that. So in other words, he had the opportunity to help the country move out of a crisis or prevent the country from getting into a crisis. He wasted the opportunity. You could go one step further. You could say this proves he was oblivious of the crisis and oblivious of how to handle it. He was oblivious of how to handle it. He was not oblivious of the crisis. He knew exactly what was going wrong in the economy. But I think his entire focus was how do I get back to power. And if he was oblivious of how to handle it, that leads you to the conclusion he lacked the political courage to do what Narasimha Rao did. Absolutely. I mean, if he had the political courage, he would have done much more when he was a prime minister. Now, you mentioned this a moment ago, but the conventional traditional view is to say that Congress disowned Narasimha Rao, distanced itself from Narasimha Rao because of his mishandling of the Babri Masjid. In fact, it's often said that he was literally asleep as the Masjid was falling. Your book, your thesis suggests that in fact the real reason why Narasimha Rao was treated so badly by Congress under Sonia Gandhi is because she wanted to protect and preserve her husband's reputation. Had Narasimha Rao got the credit he deserves, Rajiv in comparison would have been overshadowed. And then Rajiv would have been pushed into a small corner of history, Narasimha Rao occupying the grand space. She wanted to protect Rajiv, hence she disowned Narasimha Rao and Rao virtually wrote him out of history. Well, I can't enter uh, Sonia Gandhi's mind, but you know, this is a fairly convincing way of explaining uh, the, uh, her personal approach. Uh, but I think the party as a whole also uh, accepted this uh, argument that let's put all the blame on Narasimha Rao for all that went wrong because they were defeated in 96 and therefore bury the past and re recreate this glory of the Indira Rajiv era as if that was an era of great glory. And I'm arguing that Rajiv's tenure was not an era of great glory. In fact, the corollary is that the love, devotion, loyalty of a wife, who by then had become a widow, is actually what went against Narasimha Rao. Could well have been. Could well have been. And she was in a commanding position because by then she'd become president of the party. Well, she became president after 98. Yes. But increasingly indeed. more important. Yes, indeed. Could and well. I mean, this is a, this is a, a counterfactual. I mean, this is a what-if argument. Uh, but I don't rule it out. All right, let's come at this point to a second aspect of your book, which I think is equally interesting, the relationship between P.V. Narasimha Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh, who he appointed as his finance minister. You write, P.V. made Manmohan. In fact, you quote something that Narasimha Rao said to an unidentified interlocutor. He said, a finance minister is like the numeral zero. Its power depends on the number you place in front of it. The success of a finance minister depends on the support of the Prime Minister. So ultimately, the real credit for Manmohan Singh's reforms should go to Narsimha Rao. Precisely. In fact, the point I make is that the reforms were not Manmohan Singh's reforms, they were Narsimha Rao's reforms. And Manmohan Singh was an extremely important implementer of those reforms. In other words, he was the most important uh, member of the cabinet for, of Narasimha Rao. He was certainly Narasimha Rao's right-hand man. Narasimha Rao had complete trust and faith in him, and the two worked together. I have no question about it. But, but Manmohan Singh was secondary, Rao was first and primary. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it is Rao who took a view, and I mentioned in the book, that he wanted a finance minister with an international reputation of being a good economist. He first asked I.G. Patel, and I talk about that in the book. And when IG said no, he didn't want to join, come back into government, he asked Manmohan Singh. So PV was very clear in his mind what kind of a person he wanted as his finance minister. And as Manmohan Singh was his second choice. Yes. But PV already knew what sort of person he wanted, and that meant he already knew what sort of reforms had to happen. Absolutely. That's my argument. And in fact, therefore, one of the critical things your book does is to say that what we today colloquially call the Manmohan Singh reforms correctly should be called the Narasimha Rao reforms because the primary man is Narasimha Rao, the executor but secondary person was Manmohan Singh. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, to be fair to several other writers, Karan, I must mention that this argument has been made by some, some others. For example, Gurcharan Das has written this in his book. Even the recent uh, biography of Narasimha Rao by Sitapati mentions this. But 
I think none of them make the argument as forcefully as I've tried to make with the quotations I have, with the evidence I've brought to bear on this. But I think what I'm trying to do is really to underline this point that others have also made. Absolutely. In fact, you write, and I'm quoting you, having named Singh to the finance minister's job, PV never interfered with him. But, and this is equally true because it comes out in your book, there were many occasions when Narsimha Rao actually had to push a reluctant Manmohan Singh. In fact, Narsimha Rao once told you, and I'm quoting, there were times I had to push Manmohan and others. I had to tell them, I will take the political responsibility, you go ahead. Which suggests that even on the economic front, Rao was frequently the leader. He was pushing his own finance minister. The belief that the finance minister was being held back by Rao is erroneous and wrong. Uh, in, in fact, absolutely right. I mean, there were many occasions when the leader was Dr. Singh. When Manmohan Singh would lead a reform and suggest to Narsimha Rao that this is what we should do. Devaluation is one of them. But there were many other occasions where it was Narsimha Rao who was telling Manmohan Singh, look, go ahead, do this. Don't worry, I am with you. So I think that balance between the relationship is what I try to restore. Now there's another very interesting aspect of the relationship between the two men that you bring out. Dr. Manmohan Singh had a very thin skin and when faced with criticism, his instinctive response was to want or to threaten to resign. In fact, the book says he did it at least three times. And on every occasion, Narsimha Rao literally held his hand and reassured him. One gets the sort of image of an understanding elderly adult having to handle a slightly diffident at times even peevish child. Yes, indeed, yes. Diffident and peevish are two good words to describe the way I think Narsimha felt about Manmohan Singh in that period. Uh, Manmohan Singh evolved in, as a leader of the opposition. He became a much more confident person. So as a prime minister, I, in fact, he was a more confident person. But I think as a finance minister, he constantly looked uh, to Narsimha Rao for support. And this is an aspect of the relationship that either with time has been forgotten or people never really realized and noticed in the first place. It's not just been forgotten, Karan. I think the point I'd like to make is that the profession of economists, who are the only ones who have been writing about reforms, uh, repeatedly give the credit only to the economists in the system and not to the politicians in the system. I mentioned Gurcharan Das's book where he's one of the few who recognizes the role of Narsimha Rao. Now, this resignation or series of resignations from Dr. Manmohan Singh are handled very differently to the way Mr. Narsimha Rao handled two other resignations that you write about. The first is the resignation of P. Chizambaram in 1992. He was Commerce Minister. He faced a series of accusations of financial impropriety or irregularity, and he offered to resign at a press conference. The Prime Minister called his bluff and accepted. And you recount this story in your book as proof of Narsimha Rao's astute political handling. Why was it astute handling? Both Chidambaram and Mother of Sindhya were politicians uh, who were close to Rajiv Gandhi, who saw themselves as close to Sonia Gandhi and to the family. And they, their attitude towards Narsimha Rao was that, you know, he's a, a prime minister that we need not have, uh, you know, the, the sense of loyalty was not as, as strong. On the other hand, Manmohan Singh was a creation of Narsimha Rao, right? There was a difference. When Manmohan Singh threatened to resign or offered to resign, Narsimha Rao held him back. He was his man. He held him back. But when these two politicians uh, offered to resign, Narsimha Rao actually accepted their resignation to make a larger point, in my view, and this is based on my conversations with several people who worked with Narsimha Rao. That I am boss. I am the boss. And, and uh, now you can't take me for granted. In fact, you make that point most tellingly when you discuss the Madhav Rao Sindhya resignation, which happened roughly a few months later in 1993. He was civil aviation minister at the time. An air crash had taken place. He resigned. But he was hoping that the prime minister would reject his resignation. Thus, he would have the halo of staying on at the prime minister's request. And you're right. P.V. saw through the act. He was not willing to grant him the halo and so accepted the resignation. And then you conclude, after these two incidents, Sindhya and earlier Chidambaram, every congressman knew who the boss was. He stamped his authority on his government by handling these two resignations in the way he did. Absolutely. I don't think after that he got too many. I mean, the party split uh, a year later with Arjun Singh and N.D. Tiwari, the old guard, uh, walking away. But I don't think any ministers wagged their tail after that. He had stamped himself as boss clearly on everyone. Absolutely. Now, there's no doubt that you greatly admire 
Narsimhara. That comes through the book all the way through. How does he compare with three other prime ministers who've also got a lot of praise? Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Indira Gandhi, and Jawaharlal Nehru. Well, Nehru is in a class of uh, his own. You know, he was their first prime minister. He really created institutions uh, for the first time in a free India. So I think it's unfair to compare subsequent prime ministers with Nehru. What about the other two? But as far as the other two, you know, frankly, Indira Gandhi's only great achievement was the fact that she broke up Pakistan and helped create Bangladesh. Otherwise, the, her economic management has come in for a lot of criticism. And there's the emergency right? as well. There's the emergency. Then her foreign policy, I mean, she wavered here, there between, uh, she c called India a non-aligned country, but was not technically non-aligned, went with the Soviet Union, gave the impression to the West that we were allies of the Soviets, etc. She was unable to use the opportunity given by 1972, the Shimla summit, to actually come to a t settlement with Pakistan. She allowed that opportunity to go away. So Not I would actually Narsimha. say Narsimha Rao, in many ways, was even a better prime minister than Indira, but Indira earned her place in history with Bangladesh. Vajpai, Vajpai, um, again, uh, I think he, his main claim to fame was the nuclear test. If you look at the economy, it's only towards the end of Vajpayee's term that the economy begins to pick up. Otherwise, you know, for a large part of his tenure, we were still at, at, at uh, 6 to 7 percent rate of growth. The, the pickup beyond 8 percent happens after 2003. So I would, in fact, say Narsimha Rao was a better prime minister in terms of his performance of the uh, handling of the economy and foreign policy than either Indira or Vajpayee. Would you, in fact, then say that with the exception of Heru, he was the... Next, I would, yes. The next greatest? I would, absolutely. The second greatest prime the minister? The second. And you know, there's very, it's very significant. Nehru becomes prime minister on the first most important day for India, 1947. Narsimha Rao becomes prime minister on the second most important year of, for India, 1991. You know, when you look back on the history of this country over the last 60, 70 years, 1947, 1991 will remain the two important turning points. And the leadership in those two years was Nehru and Narsimha Rao. Now, as I was reading your book, there was a contrast and comparison that kept forcing itself upon me. And the more I read, the more that contrast and comparison became vivid. And I want to put it to you. On the one hand, you have Narsimha Rao, who undertook sweeping reforms that have changed India forever. But he didn't have a majority in the Lok Sabha, and often he had to act in the teeth of opposition from his own party. But the reforms happened. On the other hand, you have Narendra Modi, who was elected with everyone believing that a second set of Big Bang reforms were on the anvil and were going to happen. Modi has a majority in the Lok Sabha. He faces no opposition at all from his party. But those reforms haven't happened. Is the contrast and comparison I'm making a justified and telling one, or is it purely journalistic? No, it's an interesting one. I think 1991, Narsimha Rao suddenly realized he had become prime minister in a difficult context. And for him, this was an opportunity. He was a heart patient. He did not know how long he would live. So I think he was counting every day in office and saying, I've got to do things as quickly as possible. He was pushing himself to doing things. Mr. Modi, on the other hand, much younger when he becomes prime minister, in fantastic health condition, thinks he has 10 years in office. In one of his early speeches asked his own party to give him 10 years of stability. Uh, thinks there's no hurry. I, I have a majority, Congress party is uh, finished, 44 seats, and so was in no hurry. And in my judgment, he wasted his first year. I've uh, written this, that a lot of things could have been done in the first six months. And I think the wake-up call came when the BJP lost in Delhi to Arvind Kejriwal. Uh, and of course, the final wake-up call was Bihar. But I think what those two elections showed was that the BJP had wasted its first year. And it's only in the last year that Mr. Modi has been able to revive the government, revive his image, and revive the momentum of his government. I'm not going to ask you which of the two is greater because Modi's term is not done. I'm going to take a break for a second, come back and talk to you about the other side of Narsimha Rao, the man, because there's a lot about him that comes out which is equally intriguing and equally new and novel. We'll be back in a moment's time. See you after the break.
Welcome back to what is the point. I guess it's Sanjay Baru and we're talking about his book published on Tuesday. Here it is, 1991, how P.V. Narsimha Rao made history. Sanjay, let's come and talk a little about Narsimha Rao, the man. You report that he was denied a ticket to the Lok Sabha elections of 1991, but more importantly, you say that he was thinking seriously of becoming a priest at the Kurtalam Pitam. Are you sure about the priesthood there? Absolutely. In fact, this is a story from uh, his media as a uh, PVRK Prasad, who has written about this many years ago in the Telugu media. You know, I mean, it's not known in Delhi, it's not known to the country, but uh, Prasad was the man who was negotiating with the uh, all the saints and the sons on the Ayodhya issue. He was the interlocutor between Narsimha Rao and Shankaracharya and various other priests. He used to be the head of the Tirupati temple, the administrator of the Tirupati temple. So he was someone who was very well networked into the, the Hindu temple system. And it is he who revealed this in, a, in an article he wrote many years ago. And I only quoted uh, Prasad in this. So it was a real possibility that if Rajiv Gandhi hadn't died, Narsimha Rao, we know, wasn't going to stand for elections again that Narsimha Rao could have become a priest. Yes, indeed there's a possibility. Though, though he was also looking at another uh, profession, which is to get into the think tank world. He was planning to work with the Rajaji Institute, which is in Hyderabad. Almost the polar opposite of becoming a priest. <laughs> yeah. So in a sense, he was uncertain. Yeah. But one of the options he was seriously considering was priesthood. Yes. Now, in your book, comparing between Rajiv, Sonia, and Narsimha Rao, you write, and I'm quoting you, Rajiv lived in a world where everyone around him ate with forks and knives. P.V. was more comfortable eating with his fingers. But if Rajiv and P.V. lived in different worlds, Sonia and P.V. came from different planets. There was never any real social connect between the two. In other words, they were almost destined never to be close to each other. Absolutely. And you know, Karan, this is something that Narsimha Rao was very conscious of. In fact, a lot of people who worked with him were very close to him was still around uh, are all conscious of this this contrast between the knife and fork culture of delhi and you know eating with your hand culture of india and i think this is very sharp uh, in the, the contrast are very sharp in their minds for a lot of them and it's very interesting when mr modi gave an interview recently you know he compared himself with devagoda as opposed to uh, the delhi darbar as he called it i think there is this provincial politician in narsimha rao which was very very uh, dominant Finally, you suggest that even if Rajiv Gandhi hadn't died in May 1991, Narsimha could still have ended up as Prime Minister because if Congress was in a position to form a government, it would have had to be a coalition government and the Allies would have been more comfortable with PV rather than with Rajiv. Now, that's clearly a contrafactual bit of speculation, but are you confident of it? Well, I've given an argument why I'm confident of it. I mean, I look at the other possibilities. Pranam Mukherjee was there, and uh, Sharad, uh, Sharad Pawar was there, Arjun Singh was there. And I have actually used the autobiographies of all these uh, gentlemen, uh, Venkat Raman, Pranam Mukherjee, Sharad Pawar, Fote Dar, all their autobiographies to look at how they viewed what was happening. And it's quite clear to me, reading all of that literature, uh, that Narsimha Rao had the southern MPs with him. This is an important factor, which I emphasize in my book, that a large number of members of parliament at that time were from the south. And he was the first South Indian prime minister in India. In fact, the only... Uh, till so a whole gone. lot of circumstances would have propelled him rather than Rajiv. That's right. My last question. The present prime minister, Narendra Modi, loves to taunt Congress. He loves to score points against Congress, given... The great credit you believe that Narasimha Rao should have got but didn't get, and given the fact that he didn't get it because Sonia Gandhi in Congress actually virtually wrote him out of history, do you think it would be fitting for Mr. Modi, in recognition of what Narasimha Rao did, to give him the Bharat Ratna? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Mr. Modi should give uh, Mr. Narasimha Rao the Bharat Ratna. He gave it to Atal Bihari Vajpayee. There's absolutely no reason why he should not be giving it to Mr. Narasimha And Caucus Nuka Congress as well at the same yes. time. Yes. Yes. Sanjay Baru, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you.